The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, teach thy people to love thy house best of all dwellings, thy scriptures best of all books, thy sacraments best of all gifts, the communion of saints best of all company, and that we may as one family and in one place give thanks and adore thy glory. Help us to keep always thy day, the first of days, holy unto thee, our maker, our resurrection, and our life. God blessed forever. Amen. Well, welcome back. It's a smaller crowd today because I think many people are anticipating a full crowd at the later service, Um, but I will get you out a little early today so that you will not miss getting your spot. I promise you that. All right. So let's just jump right in today. We are in our continuing study of John's Gospel. We are in the fifth chapter, so if you have your Bibles, open them up to John chapter 5, and we're going to read through the first 18 verses of this chapter. And then come back and take a closer look at what I think is one of the most um, powerful stories, really, in terms of just what it means to really want to be healed. We all know that Jesus had a very powerful healing ministry, but Jesus approaches the man in this particular story in a way that he doesn't approach others. And I think it's very illustrative for us. So John chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, we read these words. And after this, there was a feast of the Jews... And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, an Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. You cannot help but notice every time you read through a story like this that there is a refrain in these first 18 chapters of John chapter 5. And the refrain is the expression, the Jews. We hear it over and over again. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Now, the Jews said to the man who told you that you should take up your mat and walk, And it was the Jews who were seeking all the more to kill him because he had made himself equal with the Father. Hear that phrase over and over again, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. It's a very popular phrase in the Gospel of John. It is confined almost exclusively to John. While you'll hear that phrase elsewhere in the synoptics, you only hear that phrase, the Jews, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, maybe six to ten times. Whereas in John's Gospel alone, the fourth Gospel, you're going to hear that phrase at least 70 different times. So this is a common thread that runs through the fourth Gospel, this notion of the Jews who were constantly opposed to Jesus. Now, I flag that right at the beginning because it's important that you understand what John means by that phrase. Because one of the charges that has sometimes been brought against Christians is that we are anti-Semitic, that we are against the Jews. 
that the Jews are made out to be villains in the New Testament, and in particular here in the Gospel of John. Some of you went with me to Germany this past summer, and we went to see the great Passion Play that has been taking place every year in an Alpine village since the Middle Ages, every 10 years, I should say, since the Middle Ages. It's a well-known Passion Play. Hundreds of thousands of people go to see it every single year. But just a few years ago, they completely rewrote the script. Those of you who went maybe 15, 20 years ago and saw this, uh, you'll notice that they tried to be as historically accurate as possible. So the Romans are dressed like Romans from antiquity. They're wearing togas and that sort of thing. And the Jewish population is wearing the, the, the attire that Jews, and in particular the Jewish religious leaders, would have worn in that time. Uh, the Pharisees wearing phylacteries and that sort of thing. But if you go there today, it is completely different. Um, Some of the Jewish population looks like people who may have lived in the first century, but the Roman authorities are now dressed all in black. So if you imagine them with their helmets and their red plumes and, you know, wearing togas and that sort of thing, that's not the case. If you go there today, they're dressed in gray and black and they're wearing jackboots. Now, who's that remind you of? It's designed to remind you, reminiscent of the Nazi regime, and that's exactly what it was intended to do. Why? Because the Passion Play has, in recent years, been charged with the idea that it is anti-Semitic. And it is, the Passion Play is based on, of all the Gospels, John's Gospel. So what do we have to say about that? Well, it's important that you understand that... In the Gospel of John, that phrase, the Jews, is not a reference to the Jewish population as a whole. It is almost exclusively, I say almost because there are a few exceptions to this. For example, Jesus is described as the king of the Jews later on in the Gospel. But it is almost exclusively a reference to the Jewish religious leaders, namely to the scribes and the Pharisees. So it is not an ethnic reference whatsoever. And that's important that you understand that. When it says there was a feast of the Jews, what it means is there was a feast of the Jewish religious leaders. Now, all of the population went there. It's one of the reasons why Jesus, we're told, went down to Jerusalem, because he was a Jew. But these festivals were really under the control and the authority of the Jewish religious leaders, in particular the Sanhedrin. So I want you to understand that because down through the ages, this has been an excuse, quite frankly, for Christians to be hateful towards Jews. Even Martin Luther, for example, could be very, very difficult when it came to the Jews. And he had a lot of disparaging things to say about the Jewish people as a nation. And a lot of that is based upon a misunderstanding of the Gospel of John. So I just want to flag that right from the beginning. All right, right from the beginning. You even see this in John chapter 9 as you go on a little bit later. We're told that it was the Jews who came up to Jesus. And again, we're accusing him of performing a miracle on the Sabbath. Now, we're going to come back to that whole Sabbath question, but I want to flag that right from the beginning, this refrain, the Jews, the Jews. So you understand that as we make our way through this fourth gospel, that is not a reference to the people ethnically. That is a reference in particular to the Jewish religious leaders. Now, this is an interesting story because we're told that Jesus was rejected by the Jewish religious leaders, which is interesting given the fact that by this point in his ministry, by the time we get to the fifth chapter of John, Jesus has been warmly received by almost every other class within first century Jewish society and even beyond first century Jewish society. We've already seen that he has been accepted by the Judeans in large number, uh, those who, that is, lived in the south. Jesus had also been received in, by large numbers in Galilee, which was the region to the north. In fact, he was so wildly popular in Galilee, that region to the north, that on one occasion they tried to seize him and forcibly make him their king. And because his time had not arrived, he slipped through the crowd. But Jesus, because of his miracles, because of his teaching, is becoming wildly popular among the people in the south, among the people in the north. On one occasion, the the disciples even said, you need to go down to Jerusalem because that's where all the action is. 
Galilee was more heavily populated, actually, but Jerusalem, of course, was so important to the Jews. They said, you need to go down to Jerusalem and do the things that you're doing up here in Galilee so that they can see what it's all about. And Jesus, of course, says, if you want to go to the festival, that's fine, but I'm not going to the festival because my time has not yet come. The point is that he had become wildly successful. Those huge crowds we're talk- we hear about, the 5,000 that followed Jesus in droves, this is the result of his work. He's very popular. And he's not only popular within Judaism, by this point in the gospel narrative, Jesus has also become wildly popular with even people who are not Jews. As we saw when he met the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, and we're told that he, he talked to her and he blessed her, and she went back into the town and she told others, and we're told that the whole town came out. And then they turned to the woman and they said, we now believe that this man is the Messiah, not because you have told us, but because we have heard for ourselves his words, and we know that he is the Savior of the world. So it is interesting that Jesus is becoming widely received by almost everyone within Jewish culture, with the exception of the Jewish religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the high authorities, members of the Sanhedrin. These are people who are resistant to Jesus. And that resistance is going to turn into outright animosity. Look at how today's section ends, verse 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. It starts out with just an attempt to try and discredit Jesus, but in the end, it's going to become outright attempts to have Jesus murdered. What's going on here? Why was it that the Jewish religious leaders were so opposed to Jesus? I mean, he's going out and doing acts of mercy. Certainly, jealousy is a part of it. But I think it's helpful to understand the historical circumstances a little bit to understand what was taking place here. Today's section, chapter 5, begins with this phrase, after this, sometimes it's translated, sometime later. That is to say, after Jesus had done these other things up in Galilee, a period of time elapses, we don't know exactly how much time, but a great deal has happened between Jesus' prior trip to Jerusalem and this trip to Jerusalem. He'd gone down there for one of the great feasts. You know that the Jews had many feasts. They celebrated a feast called Pentecost, which is, of course, important for Christians because it was on that day that God, the Holy Spirit, came down. They celebrated the Feast of the Tabernacles. They celebrated the Feast of Passover, which was the most important of all these, the Feast of the Booze, all kinds of feasts. The Jews had all sorts of feasts. Jesus went down, many Jews did, to Jerusalem to celebrate the festivals. Jesus was one of them. We don't know if his disciples went with him on this particular occasion because there's no reference to them, but Jesus went down to Jerusalem on this particular occasion. But as I said, something had happened between his prior visit and this visit sometime later. What had happened? A number of very important political things. The first thing is this. The Jews have been deprived of their authority when it came to capital crimes. We know that historically, that it happened during this time period. What do I mean by that? Well, if you were the governor, a Roman governor, that was a great honor. I mean, that was one of the prized positions in the government, to be a governor. You were the official representative of the emperor. There was no one higher than you in your particular province aside from Caesar himself. So to be a governor, that was a very illustrious position. Unless you were the Roman governor of Palestine. Because this was a part of the world that quite frankly was a powder keg. The Jewish people really chafed under the authority of Rome. Remember that the Jews were unique in that they were monotheistic. They only believed in one God. Now, most people in the ancient world believed in many gods. Did you know that the Jews were actually accused of being atheists? You say, how could they be accused of being atheists? They were accused of being atheists because they didn't believe in a panoply of gods. They only believed in one God, one deity. That was one of the things that marked the Jews out. And so they chafed under the authority of the Romans who believed in many gods and who even believed that the emperor himself was a demigod. 
That was a violation of the first commandment. My goodness, they absolutely despised the Romans, and they were always looking for an opportunity to overthrow Roman authority. You may not be aware of this, but the Jesus movement was not the only messianic movement of the first century. As a matter of fact, in the hundred years leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD, there were at least 100 messianic movements. That is, one on average every single year, somebody was trying to topple Roman authority. Now, if you know anything about ancient Roman history, you know that the Romans don't take that very kindly. They don't like that sort of thing. And they knew how to deal with messianic movements, incidentally. You kill the Messiah, cut off the head, and the body eventually dies. What's interesting is that the Jesus movement was the only movement of the first century in which they killed the Messiah, and the movement continued to flourish and grow. But the point I'm trying to make is that the Romans were very anxious. When Pontius Pilate got the order that he was to be made a Roman governor, he must have thought to himself, well, I finally arrived. And then he looked, and it said, governor of Palestine, and he must have thought, oh... Because this was the age of the famed Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And it was the responsibility of the governor to maintain the peace. And as you know, the governor had troops at his disposal. And the commandant of the garrison in Jerusalem at this time was a man by the name of Sejanus. And Sejanus despised the Jews. They made his job difficult And so Sejanus, working along with Pontius Pilate, began to curb the authority of the Jewish religious leaders. And one of the things they lost was the ability to execute capital crimes, execute those who had been guilty of capital crimes. And one of the capital crimes, according to the Jewish law, for example, would be like taking somebody like a Gentile into the temple precincts. That was punishable by death. If you went up to the temple in the first century, you would have seen signs marking out the entire temple complex that said, trespassers will not be prosecuted, trespassers will be executed. And there were other capital crimes, of course. Uh, If somebody was accused of adultery and found guilty of that, that was punishable by death as well. Which is, incidentally, one of the reasons why Joseph... Fast forwarding to just a few weeks from now. It's one of the reasons why Joseph desired to put Mary away quietly. Divorce her privily, as the old King James Version says. It's because if he had subjected her to public ridicule, because she had violated the marriage covenant, she could be punished by death. So the Jews had all kinds of rules and regulations, and one of their great powers was that they could execute people for capital crimes. But that was taken away from them during this time period. So they were already chafing under Roman authority, and now the power that they have is being curbed. Incidentally, this is why about a year later, they had to go to Pontius Pilate in order to have Jesus executed. Remember, it was the Romans who actually carried out the sentence. Why? Because the Jews no longer had that authority. Well, that was just one more reason for them to hate the Romans. One more reason for them to chafe under Roman authority. Not only that, but there was now an increase in zealot activity. There was a group within Judaism in the first century. They were known as zealots, and they were actively... The best way to describe them, quite frankly, is to say that they were terrorists. They were domestic terrorists who were out there constantly planning and trying to overthrow the Romans. So when this Jewish authority is curbed, there's an increase in zealot activity. And then to top everything else off, and we know this from the Gospel of John, John the Baptist gets arrested. And John the Baptist is wildly popular with the people. We're told that all of Jerusalem and Judea went out to hear this man as he was preaching in the wilderness. But he's been arrested now. In fact, that was the Gospel lesson for this morning. You you don't get to hear the sermon that Bill preached this morning, I'm sorry to say, because we don't have a sermon at Lessons and Carols. But that was the Gospel lesson today, that John the Baptist had been arrested and put away by King Herod in this desert fortress. So all of these things had happened, you see. The Jews are losing their authority. It's slowly being eroded away. 
There's an increase in zealot activity, and the Romans are clamping down hard, and John the Baptist has been arrested. So you can see the situation is becoming extremely dangerous. You think we've got it bad today? It's nothing compared to the way it was in the first century. So that's a little bit of background. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. But that's one of the reasons why the Jewish religious leaders are opposed to Jesus. Yes, they were extremely jealous of the fact that he was so wildly popular that when he preached, the people came out in droves and he'd never been officially licensed to preach. He'd gone to any rabbinical academy. And yet here he is, he preaches, and it's like E.F. Hutton. Everybody listens. When the Pharisees and the scribes talked, nobody listened because they spoke as one not having authority, whereas Jesus spoke as having authority. So yes, there was jealousy there, but there was also this political situation there, and there was fear, and there was anxiety that even more authority would be eroded away. That becomes clear if you keep your finger in John chapter 5 and flip ahead to John chapter 11 for just a second. I think this is one of the really sad commentaries on the Jewish religious leaders. John chapter 11 records one of Jesus' great miracles, and that is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Now, you know that Jesus raised three people that we know of. There may have been more, but there are three people that are recorded in the Gospels. One was a young girl who was the daughter of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Another was a young man, the widow of Nain's son. And the other person is this man, Lazarus. Each one of those stories gets more and more dramatic, incidentally. When Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, she had only been dead for a very brief period of time. The body probably hadn't even started to cool by the time that Jesus arrived at Jairus' house. And then he raised him. The next miracle, however, was even more dramatic. The funeral cortege was making its way outside the city, so this man had been dead for some time. Now, Jews tried to bury the dead the same day that they died, if possible, before sunset. But this man was definitely dead. Nobody could say, well, Jairus' daughter was simply in a coma, and they, they thought she was dead. There was no doubt about the fact that this young man was dead. And Jesus, we're told, raised him from the dead. But the most dramatic of all of these, of course, is the raising of Lazarus, because we're told Lazarus had been in the tomb for several days. When Jesus says to the sisters, roll away the stone, they say, we can't do that because there will be an odor. In other words, the body had already started to decompose, and Jesus brought him back to life. And this was an extraordinary miracle. And incidentally, it is this miracle that sets the stage for Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. On Palm Sunday, because at this point, we read in the Gospel of John, those huge crowds that have been following Jesus had dissipated. People had started to take offense at some of the things that Jesus had said, and you know what happens when you start to take offense, you simply drift away, and that's exactly what had happened. But then you get to Palm Sunday, and all of a sudden, the crowds are back, huge crowds, thousands of people. There's pandemonium. They're tearing down the palm branches from the trees, taking off their cloaks, strewing the path in front of his donkey. What's that all about? Why are the crowds back? It's because of this miracle. It was a public miracle. Lots of people had come out to counsel Mary and Martha and the loss of their brother, And as a consequence, many people witnessed this event. And I want you to notice how the Jewish religious leaders react to it. Look at verse 45 of John chapter 11. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. This would be Jewish religious leaders. But some of them went to the Pharisees, back to their fellow Pharisees, and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And what? And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. There it is. And the Romans will come and take away our place, our position, our status, our authority, our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Do you not understand that it is better 
that one man should die for the people, not the whole nation should perish? He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die. Verse 53, so from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. There it is. That's what's going on. That's the background here. And it's because of phrases like that that oftentimes the Jews have been accused of having killed Jesus. Now, I think as Christians, it is incumbent upon us to resist these charges of anti-Semitism. I think it's very important for us. If we're going to be effective as witnesses in the world, you cannot allow that charge to be lobbed against us and to allow it to stick. We need to be very clear. And I think it is very clear in the New Testament that the early Christians were not anti-Semitic. Now, down through the centuries, yes, this has been lots of excuses to hate the Jews, but the New Testament is not one of those excuses. If you look at the New Testament, what you find is actually just the opposite. You know that most of the early believers were Jewish. All of the disciples, for example, were Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. When I was in Virginia Seminary many years ago, I... Um, walked in on a discussion in the common room. We always had these big debates in the common room. And I walk in on a debate, and we had a exchange student there. He was um, studying for the Anglican priesthood, and he was from Palestine. His name was Hani Mansour. Still remember Hani Mansour. And he was in there, and he was debating with a number of other students because they were referring to Jesus as a Jew. And Hani, coming from Palestine... Being an Arab found that offensive. And they got into this big debate, and he said, no, Jesus was not a Jew. And we said, yes, he was a Jew. No, he wasn't a Jew. Well, what was he, honey? He was the first Christian, he said. (laughs) But you see, the situation hasn't changed much in all of these years. But Jesus was a Jew. That's just a fact of history. Whether we like it or not, whether we find it convenient or not, is irrelevant. And furthermore, Peter was a Jew. Paul was a Jew. Andrew was a Jew. James was a Jew. And many of the first converts were Jewish. We're told that 3,000 people were converted on the day of Pentecost alone. And they were all what? Jews. Now, they may have been Jews from outside of Jerusalem, Jews of the diaspora, but they were Jews. In the early days, the church was Jewish. Now, it's going to expand with the ministry of Paul and Silas and Timothy and Barnabas and others, but in those early days, it was Jewish. So the charge that the church is anti-Semitic is just rubbish. It's not true. The early Christians were Jews. Furthermore, Paul makes it very clear that he has unceasing anguish in his heart for the fact that his own people rejected Christ. In fact, on one occasion, Paul says something. I I find it just mind-boggling that Paul would even say this. Being enlightened as he was with the gospel, he says that if I could exchange place with them. In other words, if I could make it that they would believe and I would take the punishment for unbelief, he said, I would gladly take their place. Paul says, I have unceasing anguish in my heart for my own people. And furthermore, the New Testament, and Paul in particular, acknowledges the fact that the Jews had a great many blessings, that God had poured out his blessings upon them, and that they were his chosen people. So when people say, well, Christians are just anti-Semitic, I, I, I really wish I was the theological advisor for the Passion Play at Omer Gamoral, because I would set them straight. But they haven't asked me to do that job yet, so... Well, all of that is background to this event that we are looking at today, where Jesus is in Jerusalem. The situation is dangerous, to say the least. He's walking along, and he comes upon a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. Now, I love this story for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that it is a testimony to the trustworthiness of the biblical record. We're told that this pool had five roofed colonnades. Now, in the latter part of the 18th century and through the greater part of the 19th century, those who were skeptical about the reliability of the biblical text said, here's a perfect example of why you can't trust the Bible. 
Because they said there is no pool in antiquity that we know of that has five covered colonnades. That implied that it was probably the shape of a pentagon or something like that. And they said, we know that the Jews never built pools like that. So you can't trust the Bible, it's just not trustworthy. Well, one of the things about archaeology is that it has proven to be the great friend of biblical historicity. As more and more discoveries have been made, the line of trustworthiness, as far as the Bible is concerned, continues to move in the right direction. And this is a perfect example. Archaeologists were working in and around what is now the Church of St. Anne, just outside the beautiful gate in Jerusalem. And guess what they discovered? They discovered a pool that had five covered colonnades. Now, it was not in the shape of a pentagon. It was actually two pools side by side with colonnades on four sides and one going right down the center like a bridge between them. And as time went by, they actually discovered that this was, in fact, the Pool of Bethesda, a testimony to the trustworthiness of John's gospel. And if you think that that's just something that happened 100 years ago, Jesus refers later on to the Pool of Siloam in John chapter 9 when he heals the blind man. Many people did not think that the Pool of Siloam existed until the year 2005. How many of you were around in 2005? <laughs> we were all around in 2005. And that is a testimony, again, to the trustworthiness of the Bible. They actually discovered it. Now, these pools were known as mikvahs. And that meant they were pools for ceremonial cleansing. But they were also places that people believed had healing properties. And that's why the blind, the lame, the paralyzed were told gathered here. Now, this is not something that is ancient. You know that people today still go to places where there are springs. Uh, you've all heard of White Sulphur Springs in Virginia. That was a very popular place for Virginians and Southerners at the end of the 19th century. People went there for the healing property of the pool. Warm Springs, Georgia. That's where Franklin Roosevelt used to go every year because he was suffering from polio, and he would go there and he would swim. Well, that's the way it was in the ancient world. People would go to these pools, which they believed had healing properties. Now, this particular pool, apparently, they believed had supernatural healing properties. Because we're told that when Jesus went up to the man and he said, do you want to be healed? The man replies, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. This is a pool that was probably built over something like an artesian well or spring, and the water would from time to time bubble up, and people thought that that was a healing agency. Many people believe that an angel, some translations say, um, or older versions say, that an angel came and stirred the water. And the belief was, of course this was meritorious, the belief was that if you could be the first one into the water when the angel stirred it, then you would be healed. So when Jesus asked this man, do you want to be healed, he says, I, I can't get into the water. And he'd been brought there every year, every day, for 38 years. It's a bleak situation. But I think the description is what is so powerful. Look at how John describes it. He said, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and the, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Now why do I think that's such a powerful description? Because I think that that is not just a picture of these people who were physically disabled. I think that's a powerful picture of the human condition. Spiritually speaking, that's a good description of us, isn't it? We are the blind. We do not oftentimes see our own sin, nor do we see our own need for a savior. We are the blind. We are the lame. If we come to Jesus Christ at all, most of us come limping, haltingly. And we are the paralyzed. We're just like this man, spiritually speaking. Physically, he couldn't get into the water. Spiritually speaking, you and I are dead in our trespasses and in our sins. That's the way the Apostle Paul describes us 
in Ephesians. He says, you're not just sin sick and sorrow worn. You are dead in your trespasses and in your sins. And unless God does for you what he did for Lazarus, unless he makes you alive again, you cannot come to him. So as you read through this story, just don't picture a man who is in a pitiful situation. Imagine yourself spiritually in precisely the same situation. The blind, the lame, the powerless. This is why the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5 says, When did Christ die for us? While we were still powerless. While we were still powerless, Christ came and died for us. Not when we had managed to heal ourselves or get our act together, but while we were still powerless. This is a woeful picture of the human condition that we see here. And what Jesus is going to do for this man physically is what he promises to do to all of us spiritually if we will simply believe. Now, there's a lot more that I want to say about this, but I do want to get you to church on time. So let me just close with this. When Jesus finds this man by this pool, he comes up to him and he asks him a question, which if you think about it, seems like a self-evident answer. Jesus finds this man, who we're told had been an invalid for 38 years, who was brought there on a regular basis, who could not get into the water on time, and Jesus asks him the question, do you want to be healed? Now, if I'd asked that kind of a question, you know what my kids would say? Duh. (laughs) Of course I want to be healed. Why do you think I'm here? Of course I want to be healed. Why would Jesus ask a man like this that question, do you want to be healed? I'll tell you why. Because just some, because somebody is in a pitiful condition doesn't mean that they necessarily want to be healed. In fact, sometimes even when you ask somebody, do you really want to be made well? Do you really want to be made whole? They may say that they do, but they really don't. And that could very well have been the situation with this man. You ask the question, why wouldn't someone want to be healed? Well, let me tell you something. I've been doing ministry for 30 years, and I have come along lots of people who have come to me for advice and for counsel and for help. And I will ask a question like this. Are you prepared to do whatever it takes in order to, get, to mend the relationship? Are you prepared to do whatever is necessary in order to grow in your relationship with the Lord? People will sometimes come and say, I want to grow closer to the Lord. What do I need to do? You give them the answer, but oftentimes they find that the answer is not what they were hoping for. There are some people, quite frankly, that do not want to be healed because they like being the victim. They like being the center of attention. And we know people like this. It's not meant to be disparaging. It's just a fact of life. that There are some people that like to play the victim. And if all of a sudden they're healed, the victim status is removed. And you can no longer be the victim. There's also, and I think this is the main reason why Jesus asked this man the question, there's also the fact that when you are healed, a change takes place, but a change is also required. I want you to notice what Jesus said to this man when he heals him. He doesn't simply say, be healed. He says what? Take up your mat. Take up your bed and walk. Why does he have to take up his bed? Which, incidentally, is what gets Jesus in trouble in the first place. Because the Jews see this man carrying his mat. It's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to carry a burden on the Sabbath. And they said, why are you carrying your mat? And he said, the man who healed me told me to take my mat, take my bed and walk. And they say, well, who is this man? Why did Jesus tell him to take up his bed? Because that bed was symbolic of his situation. It was symbolic of his weakness. It was symbolic of his sickness. And Jesus was going to heal him of that. And that bed was no longer going to be a part of his life. You know, we all have problems in our lives. Spiritual problems. And Jesus comes in and he asks the question that he asked this man. Jesus asks us the question, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed of that addiction? Do you want to be healed of this brokenness, this propensity? 
And before we say, well, of course I do, duh, we need to ask ourselves, are we prepared for the change? For this man, it was going to be a dramatic change. How did he make his living? He made his living the way that every invalid in the first century made his living, by begging. Once he's healed, there's no excuse for begging. What does he have to do? He has to go out and get a job. See, the problem with being healed is that it requires a change, and it brings about a change. And let's just go ahead and admit it, folks. Sometimes change is difficult, even good change. Reminds me of the man who was once accused of not liking change. He was an old curmudgeon. They said, well, the problem with you is you just don't like change. And he said, that's not true. He said, I do not mind change at all, so long as it doesn't make any difference. And that's the way it is for many people, isn't it? I don't mind a change, provided that it doesn't make any difference. Well, Jesus comes into our life to those of us who are blind, spiritually lame, and paralyzed. And what he says is, do you want to be healed? And if you do, the promise is that the Son of Man who came into this world to seek and to save the lost will heal you. But he will require a change in your life. He's going to give you the power and the wherewithal to be a new creation, to live differently, to live no longer unto yourselves, but unto him who died for you and rose again and promises you new life. So we've all got our issues, we've all got our problems whether it's an addiction to something, whether it's an addiction to alcohol or to drugs or to pornography, whether it is that victim status that some of us have. We like playing the victim, thinking that we are the one that is always put upon. Whatever it is in your life, maybe it's a broken relationship, a broken marriage, whatever it is in your life that you know needs to be healed, Jesus comes and he asks you the question, do you want to be healed? But before you say yes, ask yourself, am I ready to change? Because Jesus never touches anyone and leaves them the way he found them. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise for this story of this man. We thank you that Jesus was willing to heal him at great personal cost because it was in healing this man that Jesus' life really, in many respects, became forfeit because from this time on, the Jewish religious leaders would seek to kill him. Jesus brings healing to our lives too, and he does so at great personal cost, at the cost of his own life, for he allows himself to be lifted up upon the cross and pierced for our transgressions. And he comes then as the great physician and he says, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be washed in the blood, made pure, made white? Grant that we may answer honestly, yes, and grant that we may be prepared to change to take up our mat, to leave our old life behind and to begin to follow hard after him, even unto death and life eternal. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.